Hi, I'm Dave Erickson, a retired EE and a lifelong circuit designer. And this is the DataCube story. The title is DataCube Story, Former World Leader in Image Processing Technology, Chapter 1, or How I Spent the 80s and the 90s. For more detail on DataCube and this technology that we've developed, check out my DataCube webpage at www djerickson.com slash datacube. Datacube was the performance leader in commercial image processing technology for most of the 25 years that it was in business. I was with Datacube for 17 years, initially as a hardware engineer, then as director of hardware engineering for most of that time. We developed several generations of image processors from some of the first multibus and Qbus frame grabbers to the top performing image processors in the world. Each new product was a major step in image processing performance. So, how to introduce a company and a technology that a small team of talented engineers developed? For 25 years, we were the leaders in commercial real-time image processing. We were the state of the art for most of that time. And we're mostly successful and profitable. We serve wide-ranging OEM markets from medical imaging, industrial inspection, machine vision, military, scientific, and entertainment, and all with the same set of hardware and software. DataCube was founded by Jay Dunn and Stan Danis in 1979. Jay was a sharp digital designer, and Stan was an EE turned manager slash salesman. Stan came up through the Silicon Valley history. He was the director of engineering at MMI when John Berkner and H.T. Schwa invented the PAL. At MMI's public offering party in the late 70s, he shipped in a bunch of Maine lobsters, and armed with lobsters and beer, Stan convinced a handful of his fellow MMI principals to invest in his new East Coast startup, DataCube. Jay and Stan produced a dozen multibus memory and video character display boards for Intel, ATMs, and other manufacturers of multibus systems. Multibus was the big CPU bus at the time, and so a lot of OEMs used it. One customer requested a video digitizer, and Jay and Stan accepted the challenge. They developed the VG120, the first commercial frame grabber. The challenge of telling the story is that most of the technology that we developed barely exists anymore. The company closed its doors in 2005. There are still dealers that sell some of the old hardware to support existing systems, but the documentation, schematics, manuals, and software have all faded into the past. The team went on to other companies, many are still in the imaging field. I thought that it would be interesting to tell this story from the point of view of the technology. I'm going to try to recreate some of this from memory and by doing a teardown of some products that our engineering team and I developed 30 and 40 years ago. And I'll try to explain pipeline image processing in the process. Wish me luck. During our product development in the 80s and 90s, I drew many, many block diagrams of the hardware that we developed. I just recreated a few of these from memory and from looking at the few boards that I do have, enough to outline what we did and to serve as a foundation for understanding the technology we developed. Instead of boring you with the entire history, I'll start with the middle and work my way backwards and forwards in time. I think the middle is kind of an interesting point. So this is a Max Video 20 that we're looking at. And Max Video 20 was developed around the late 80s and it was a, quite an accomplishment in both technology and packaging density. Max Video 20, or MV20, incorporates all the key functions of a powerful image processing system. It acquires, processes, and displays the results. It is equivalent to about 12 of the previous Max Video 10 boards in functionality, but at twice the speed, 20 megahertz, of the original Max Video 10 boards. It occupies just two VME board slots, while still maintaining the modularity of the previous board level products. As you can see from the hardware, we use plug-in SIM modules and daughter boards to provide modularity to understand what the hardware does. This is the block diagram for the Max Video 20. The key element that ties everything together is the cross point switch. The cross point switch allows any image source to connect to any image destination. It's configured as 32 by 32 by 8 bits so that there are 32 inputs and 32 outputs. It was a key piece of the technology. It replaced 
the blue cables that we used on our previous Max Video products. And the blue cables sort of limited you to uh, a certain configuration of pipeline. There was still a lot, of, a lot of flexibility within that and within the boards that we built. And in fact, we even built a cross-point board that allowed you to switch sources. So for example, if you had three different sources that you wanted to feed into one destination, you could feed them in through our cross-point switch and it, and it allowed that. So the next uh, critical element in any image processing system is the ability to digitize from a sensor. And we had three different sensor modules that could plug in. Each one was a SIM form factor. There was AS, AD, and AC. AS was a 26 megahertz 8-bit analog. AD was a 20 megahertz 24-bit digital input. And AC could accept either RGB or NTSC or PAL or any, any kind of color input. Uh, the sensor modules, the AS and AD, were also universal. They could accept a clock or generate a clock, or they could regenerate a clock from a phase lock loop. So they could accept just straight composite input. They could accept any combination of horizontal and vertical sinks, or they could generate any combination of horizontal and vertical sinks. We pretty much researched every line scan and area scan sensor that was available at the time and made sure that AS and AD had the ability to, uh, to interface with them all. And that was critical for, for lots of applications. AG is the video output module, and AG stands for analog generator. And this generated RGB video and syncs to a VGA monitor. And it could accept either a monochrome or RGB inputs. It had a RAM DAC on board, so it could translate uh, into pseudo color. And it had a video timing generator that could generate video timing for I don't know, 10 or 15 different uh, monitor resolutions. And this also generated the clocks for the, uh, for the main Max bus and the synchronization clocks for all the, all the boards. There are six image memories on a Max Video 20, and they're implemented as an independent triple-ported ROI memory. By triple-ported, we mean it can input a video stream, simultaneously output a video stream, and simultaneously be accessible from the CPU bus so that a host processor can go in and randomly, uh, randomly access any uh, data within that. There are ROI memories, which means region of interest. And what that means is that the input video and the output video can be arbitrary rectangles within that memory. So for example, I can input a full frame of data, but then output a small tile of that image, or numerous small tiles. So I can process individual tiles or I can process the entire memory. So once you make a decision of, for example, where your target wants to be, then you can choose the rectangle that contains that and only do the processing on that rectangle from then on. That's one use of ROI memory. The other is because we don't know what the sensor resolution is or the display resolution is, the ROI memories have the ability to, to interface to all those different sensor and output resolutions. The ROI memories are used for, for just about all image processing operations. For a arithmetic or a filtering or any other pipeline image process, these are the source and destinations that are used to provide the data and to receive the uh, results. This block, AU, is our arithmetic unit, and that's an ASIC. And it consists of, of a handful of 10-bit uh, multipliers that can be reconfigured as a 16-bit or a 20-bit multiplier. It has arithmetic, all the arithmetic uh, standard functions, add, subtract. It has a bunch of linear and nonlinear functions as well. So it can do median filtering, it can do maximum and minimum filtering as well. AU also has some statistical processing as well. So for example, it can sum all the pixels, it can count the number of pixels, it can generate the uh, generate statistics on, on, a, on a region of interest as well. The next processing module is our optional AP Advanced Processing Daughter Board, and that's this rectangle here. It consists of three functions that are on the board and an optional fourth module. So the first function is a 16 by 16 lookup table. Uh, in image processing, you can never have too many lookup tables. Lookup tables are used for converting images, uh, for example, converting signed to unsigned, for linearizing gamma correction. They can be used for a logarithmic conversion of images, sine, cosine, you know, any 
any unary operator can be used. It can do two unary operators on 8-bit data, or it can do any binary operation. So for example, if I want to take you know, a, Euc a Euclidean, if I want to take the square root of the sum of the squares of two images, I can program this lookup table to generate the square root of the sum of the squares. Uh, it can generate two different values, two different 8-bit values or, or a 16-bit value as a function of that. Pretty much any uh, linear or nonlinear function that you can think of can go into a lookup table. The next element is the probably the most compute intensive element on the board and that's an 8x8 8 8 or 16, 64x1 convolver. And that consists of 64 8x8 8 8 multipliers and a giant adder tree that can sum all the results. Convolution and fur filtering are two of the main elements of image processing and they're used for high pass, low pass filtering, edge filtering, pattern matching, band pass filtering, uh, you name it. There's a, a whole ton of uh, image processing functions that are done in real time. And the fact that we're doing 64 points at 20 megahertz gives a fairly phenomenal uh, number of, uh, of uh, points of filtering per second. The next module is the histogram Huff transform. Histograms are very useful for image processing. This element also does feature listing. Uh, in other words, it will give you the XY location of a feature that you've detected. And also it will do a Huff transform. A Huff transform generates an image that's a function of the angles that are present in a, uh, in a, in a source image. So for example, if I want to detect all the 30 degree lines or lines that are 30 degrees from horizontal, I can program that into the Huff transform and it will generate uh, a resultant image with all those uh, features highlighted. The next module is, uh, we call it Max Module, and there are several Max Modules that we offered. Mini Warper was a real-time multi-dimensional image warper that could do image rotation, shrinking, uh, zooming, uh, rescaling. Max Module uh, Rank Value Filter, RVF, which is a rank value filter, and uh, Max Module NMAC, which is an, another convolver. These were some of the image processing functions that were optional that, that uh, some of our customers used. Uh, these ports up here are the blue ribbon cable uh, front panel connections, the Maxbus ports. And these ports down here are P2 ports. On the P2 connector of the VME bus, there are 64 unused pins, and these pins use those connectors to communicate to the next board over. So for example, if you didn't want to use front panel, blue cables, you could, you could wire your backplane to connect this MAX-20 board to the next MAX-20 board if you had two of them in the system, or to multiple MAX-20 boards. And, and these boards were used to, to pipe image data from, uh, from board to board. And of course, the MAX bus also, I don't show it on here, but the clocking and the ROI timing were also uh, present on this board. So let's look at the, let's look at the hardware. And we can see what some of these uh, some of these functions look like. So this is a Max Video 20. Uh, it, the f here's the blue Max Bus connections on the front. This is the uh, Max Bus P3 and P4. P3 provides the clocking to synchronize multiple boards. P4 provides the ROI timing between boards. And then these next six ports are general purpose 8-bit data ports and they can operate at 10 or 20 megahertz and communicate to other Max Video hardware, either to older boards or to, to different, uh, different boards. Uh, the VME P1 and P2 connectors are on the back, and you can't see them from this angle, but when, when I rotate it around, you'll be able to see them. This module here is an AS module, which is the uh, analog sensor. This is the sensor connector. It's a 44-pin connector, so the, all the Timing, digitizing, signal conditioning for all the analog sensors is uh, on this module. And this module can be replaced with a AD, which is the digital inter sensor interface, or AC, which is the color sensor interface. Over here is the AG. This is a VGA, 15-pin VGA connector to drive the monitor. So you just plug a VGA monitor into here. This contains the uh, RAM DAC and all the uh, video timing for the display ports. It also has the master clock for the system. These six modules 
are the Roysim modules. I'll take one of them out and, and show you some details on it. This L-shaped board here is the AP, which is the advanced processor. And if I turn it around, get a better view of that. And before I talk about that, I can let me remove it. Uh, I don't have it completely installed. There's 200 pins. The thing is, requires a small, little tiny crowbar to remove. So anyway, here's the main board, and you can see one, two, three, four of the cross points, and each one of these is configured as a 32 by 32 by 2 bit cross point, and so there's eight bits of total cross point. Oh, you can see a lot of the a lot of the motherboard space is taken up on the on the cross point. This is the AU ASIC, which we developed, and that has the that's the arithmetic unit. This is an Actel chip, which I believe provides the Roy timing cross point because the data cross points don't have the Roy timer. So all these, every device here, which is a Roy timer, has to be able to communicate through to any other device. So there's a, a Roy timing cross point with four buses, and that's I think that's this device. These three devices are the uh, some of the VME bus interface. If I flip the port over, you'll see that there's quite a few small-scale devices that are used for uh, bus buffering for the max bus connections here. I believe these are the uh, some of the data bus buffers for the uh, for the VME bus. There's probably some clock distribution on here as well because there's lots of clocking. But yeah, you can see what a what a dense board this is. So let me put the AP advanced processor uh, back on. Not plugged on all the way. So this is the convolver. This is an LSI logic device which does a 64 point multiply accumulate con convolution. It does all by itself it does 64 by 1 filtering but to get 8 by 8 filtering 8 delay lines, 7 delay lines are required. The first, um, the first eight don't have a delay line, and these devices, there's eight of them, uh, are the delay lines that are used to generate the vertically adjacent pixels. So you stream in video into the delay line, and then the output of the delay line is the the input is is the raw data, and the output is the next line, and then the next line, the next line, the next line. So that's how we get an eight by eight neighborhood of pixels to to be able to uh, filter all at once. This section up here is the 16 by 16 lookup table, and I believe it's uh, there's four banks of 16 by 16 lookup tables because I I looked at the memories and they're, uh, each memory is 256 by four, so 16 by 16 lookup table would only require 64k by uh, 16, or or 64k by four in each device, uh, but because as I said you can never have too many lookup tables this. Pro the 256 memory provides four banks of lookup tables, so you can provide four different functions, and you can change functions just by changing the two upper bits without having to reprogram the whole lookup table. And so that's that uh, sp speeds up uh, changing from one lookup table function to another very quickly. Uh, this section over here is the histogram huff section. This chip does the histogram, does most of the histogram and huff processing, but it requires uh, an additional sequencer, and so this is a wafer scale. It's called a PAC 1000, and it's a, a, a programmable uh, sequencer. It's, it generates addresses, and it can uh, it can it can do uh, it can do complicated uh, timing sequences as well. And I believe that there's a data path on this as well. And so that plus this dual port RAM, basically this whole this whole end of the end of the board is the histogram and huff transform section. And then there's these three white connectors and the, and the mounting, uh, mounting hardware here that allow a max module to plug on. I don't have any max modules, but the, this is where your uh, a mini warper or a uh, uh, rank value filter or some other max module functions uh, can reside. So that's Max Video 20. Uh, max, as I said before, Max Video 200 looks almost identical except that it has uh, uh, vSIM memories in here instead of these uh, these very dense Roy SIM memories.
and that's the main difference between Max Video 200 and Max Video 20. And Max Video 250, the Roy Sims are laid down on, right on the board, and there are no there are no plug-in SIM modules. It, we still needed the front end module to be optional, and all the rest of this is uh, is on a, on a on a second board. So yeah, that was a pretty significant uh, shrink of the technology, even beyond this. And we also used more advanced surface mount technology. For example, these LSI logic chips are all in pin grid packages, which was the only package that was available at the time. But uh, by the time Max Video uh, 200 and 250 came out, these were available in uh, QFP packages, which shrunk, shrunk everything down significantly. I hope you've enjoyed this video and hope you got something out of it. Maybe learned a little bit about it, pipeline image processing and learned what kind of technology we were using in, back in the 80s and 90s. For the next video, if there's interest, I will do a teardown of the, the AS module, the AG module, the RoySim module, and I also have, uh, have this guy, which is a, one of the previous generation uh, Max video boards. This is called Max Scan, and this was the first generation universal digitizer. And I think it's got some interesting technology on it that's even older than the previous. Notice there's no surface mount on this board. Uh, so that's that's what I'm planning to do next if there's interest. Thanks. Let me know.